Go to your Bibles to Psalm 127. We'll be looking at Psalm 127 today. And the title of the sermon today is actually some of the first verse of Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Now most of us are like, Amen. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. We can... We can look at that verse and just reflect on many things that we have put our hands to in our life that the Lord did not ordain us to put our hands to, meaning that he wasn't blessing the work. Like, I mean, I put my hands and, and got many situations rolling that I probably shouldn't have done. Amen? Now, I just came from vacation, or came back from vacation, as, as Nick shared with you guys, and it was, it was two weeks long. That, that, was, a, that was a long vacation. <laughs> It, it, but it was, a, it was a good vacation in the fact that it was just long enough for me to be ready to come back. Anybody ready to take one of those, those vacations? And I realized something when I was on vacation. People are weird. I guess some of you guys think I'm weird, but man, if you ever met like a lost person, <laughs> they're even weirder. Yeah, I might have some lost tendencies, but when you live like that, that is like, you know, the blind lead the blind, you stumble, you run into everybody. I mean, we were at Disney World and it's just packed <laughs> full of that sort of type of, of people. Um, and there was a person, and these people are not aware of their surroundings. I'm going to give you the PG version of the story. My wife said don't share it, but I feel like it's important for me to share it. Um, there was a person. Okay, I'm going to be very gentle. There was a person. Nick knows what I'm about to say. There was a person, and they were in front of my family, and about this much of their butt was hanging out. Okay? I'm not, and I'm not kidding you. Okay? So there was a person in front of my family, and this much of their bottom was hanging out. Okay? It was extremely disturbing, but the most disturbing part about this was the person was either unaware of this, or they didn't care. <laughs> and so that was just one thing that I, I noticed, and I, and I, I thought to myself, like, can they not feel the breeze? <laughs> like, like, really? Like, when, if I bend over to pick something up, I mean, I could feel, you know, that my, my butt's hanging out a little. I could feel it, you know? I might not mind it sometimes, but I can feel it. And, and, and I was just, I was extremely perplexed. I know this isn't super, super spiritual, but it just shows that people either are ignorant with their condition or they don't care about their condition. And I started noticing other things when we were at Disney World. You know, we live in the generation of the, the Instagram. Now, it's, it's sad because I'm realizing I'm getting old because I talk like this. But I, I've realized, you know, some things where, you know, it used to be Facebook. If you like, you're like, oh, Facebook's a thing. You're old now. It's Instagram. It's not Facebook. So those of us who love Facebook, we're like, that's old now, you know. I did MySpace. That's even older, right? We're going a little bit further back, right? And, and, and then the next generation, we, we just communicated through email. And after that, you know, it was horse carrier, right? <laughs> we go back. And so but I noticed something when we're at this world in particular is that a lot of the younger generation, they're constantly being consumed with making sure that they're taking pictures of their experience. And they're making sure that they're catching all these moments. And I used to be critical of that. I'm like, just enjoy life. Stop taking pictures. You know, just you know, put it in your, in your, your mind and you can reflect back. And you're missing so much life. We're being worried about you know, the perfect you know, Instagram picture with the right filter. And, but then the Lord showed me something. They actually have something right. See, what they're doing is that they're showing off their life. Now, they're showing off the wrong life. They're showing off the self-life. But as Christians, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to show off Christ's life. Like, we're supposed to show people the life we live in Christ by the life we live. We should be presenting that to all those who are around us. And we also should be passing down that to our kids. And see, my hope is, it's a hope. And my kids are the best case scenario that I'm able to, to show off the life of Christ and pass it down to my kids, the gospel and God's truth. And just maybe, hopefully, they'll repeat the process. And they won't be caught up in the rat race of the world and show off self-life. They will show off Christ's life. Now, before we get into Psalm 127, we've got to talk about the context. Now, last time... Uh, I did a preaching. I talked about the context and I connected it to Homer Simpson and the donut. Anybody remember that? That some of you guys got it or most people got it. And, you know, <clears throat> sometimes when you talk about context, some of you guys, you know, tune off. And you're like, Homer Simpson and the donut. Oh, like you're, just, you're not paying attention. You're like, oh, just whatever, you know, context. And I love context. You might not. 
But context is still important. Whatever your, your position in, is on it, it is still important. And this is an analogy of why context is important. If I had a, a like I was kidding around with Steve, okay? Steve and I are, are, are having a joke back and forth, and, and it's, it's super lighthearted. And, and he's like, I'm going to kick you in the face. I know some of you are like, that doesn't seem lighthearted. We're just totally getting around. And he like wrote it on a piece of paper. And so he's like, I'm going to kick you in the face. We're passing notes, right? Because that's mature, right? And so I, I, I wrote down on a piece of paper, like, Steve, I'm going to punch you in the face from Brian. And I give it to, I give it to Steve. And she's like, ah, oh, you're kidding, whatever. And he goes off and he lives his life. And he puts that note in his pocket. And through his living life, the note falls out of his pocket. And it lands, you know, on the ground. And somebody picks it up who knows Steve and knows myself. And they read the note. And they're like, oh, my gosh. Brian is going to punch Steve in the face. And then they go around telling everybody else. Look, Brian said he's going to punch Steve in the face. Brian's going to punch Steve in the face. See, context is important. See, they didn't understand that the original writing of it was lighthearted. See, they didn't understand that. And see, their perception of it is distorted. It's not right because they didn't understand the context of what was going on in our, in our relationship. Steve, you're not going to kick me, right? No. I won't punch you either. You have my word. <laughs> now, the context of, 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 of Psalm 127 is pretty simple. Psalm and wrote it. Amen. It's Hebrew poetry, inspired by God. Pretty simple so far, right? Now, this is also a messianic psalm. Now, this is where some of you guys are like, what's going on here? Right? Well, meaning this, that, that when Solomon sat down and wrote it, he's, he's writing about what's happening in his, in his moment life, but it's also shadowing a life to come, Christ. It's, it's also pointing to Christ. Now, this is also uh, an ascent psalm, and what that simply means is that the Israelites would sing this psalm and other psalms on their way up to the temple as, as, as worship. So they were going up to the temple, they were ascending to the temple in the ascent psalm. Pretty simple so far, right? Yeah. All right, so now let's jump into Psalm 127, and we'll start in verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in Vain. Now Solomon is looking at what's in front of him, which is the kingdom of Israel, the temple. But the shadow is the kingdom of God, the thing to come, Christ to be revealed. Now so, or Proverbs uh, 16, verse 9 says that in their, in their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. In their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes, establishes their steps. And I think about that, that unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain, in their hearts, humans plan their course. And I remember many of the things that I thought that I wanted to do that were so wrong. My whole life was driven. I planned the course of my life to be successful. I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to have a name for myself. I wanted money. I, I, wanted, I wanted key relationships. I wanted to feel good, have fun. I wanted everything that the world had to offer. Oh, I planned my course. But thank God. That the Lord established my steps. See, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And right here, I think about I think about Haggai. Now, right now, some of you guys are like, Haggai, who's that? Well, he was in Lord of the Rings. I'm just kidding. That's Haggai. <laughs> Haggai was a prophet of the Lord that, that God raised up after the exile. So the Israelites went into exile because they failed in their relationship with God. And then God raised up nations to conquer them and put them into exile and the captivity and the temple would be destroyed. And then after some time of learning, God placed them in a place of discipline and judgment. He brought them back to the promised land. And now they had, they had a responsibility. They had to rebuild what was destroyed because of their failure to be right with God. Their failure to worship God. And so you would think they learned a hard lesson. Come back. Okay, guys, the temples and ruins are a reminder of our failed relationship with God. Let's start building God's house. But that's not what they did. They, start, they started focusing on their houses. They started focusing on their stuff. They started building with their vain hands. And the Lord raised up Haggai to steer the ship, to call them to repentance, to stop focusing on their house and start focusing on his house. And they would eventually make the turn. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. This is grace. See, unless the Lord builds the house, see, we need his work. We need Christ's work. We need his perfect work for salvation. See, unless the Lord builds the house, unless he builds it. See, that's why we need Christ's work. We need his work counted to us, and that's God's grace. And see... Jesus talks about what the life of being a Christian looks like in the Sermon on the Mount. The most sermon ever preached by, by our Lord himself. In Matthew 7, 
um, uh, verse 24, he says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What is Jesus talking about? Unless the Lord builds the house, see, we need his work. We need his work. See, there, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What's the rock? The gospel. Regeneration, to be made alive, to, to have a new heart, to, to have a new nature. Justification, to be made right with God in faith by Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Sanctification, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to go a new and different way. And that leads us into the end game, which is glorification. When we see Jesus face to face in perfection. That's what it means to build your house on the rock, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. That's God's house. If you're going to set up your life, you want to make sure that, that you're in His house. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. But everyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. That's our house apart from God. See, when you hear somebody preaching the gospel, that is the alarm that a storm is coming and it is going to decimate your house. And if you don't get out of it, you will lose everything. See, that is what the gospel is. It is the alarm that you're in the wrong house. You need to evacuate soon. If not, the storm of God's eternal judgment is going to wash you away. That is why we need to make sure that we are building our life on the rock. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Nehemiah would build the walls and they come crumbling down by Rome. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. I think about um, America. Unless the guards watch over the city, or unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watching. Man, think about America right now. It appears that maybe the Lord's no longer watching over us. I hope that's not the case. I hope that's not the case. But it appears to be in this moment. Nations rise and nations fall. See, before the exile, God protected Israel from, from her enemies. See, we, we, need, we need God's sovereign protection because we fight an enemy that we cannot see. God protects us daily from things that we don't even know we need protection from. See, there's two types of protection or two types of grace. There's common grace and there's divine grace. Divine grace, the gospel, salvation, God's word. And there's common grace. See, common grace God gives to all. Divine grace God gives to to some. Common grace is the period of time that God sustains creation before eternal judgment. That's common grace. Every, everything in God's creation is afforded that opportunity. They're afforded breath in their lungs or they're afforded the gifts that God gives them. See, common grace holds humanity back from being as bad as it could be. And we see that in the Noah Covenant. What God says to Noah in Genesis. When he says, never again will I flood the earth because of man's sinfulness. Have we gotten better since the flood? No, 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 no. God's grace has gotten greater. See, common grace is God holding humanity back from being as bad as it could be. In any moment in time, if God were to remove his hand, we would implode in ourselves. And we see this uh, of common grace in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Paul speaks of it. He says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. That's common grace, not divine grace. John 3, 16. That God so loved the world, that He sent, that He gave His one and only Son. And whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Divine grace. As Paul says, blessed, or, or how beautiful are the feet of those who deliver good news. Ephesians 1, 4 says, Paul says that we were chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. Think about that. Think about that. Before the creation of the world, you were marked off in Christ 
before you make any decisions. Thank God that my salvation doesn't hinder on me coming to the reality by chance of choosing God. You know, if that's the case, if everything was left up to chance, prophecy wouldn't come true. But thank God, God in His sovereignty looks over my life, and I don't know how it all works, but yet it does, that He saved me before I even realized I needed saving. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't know why He chose me. Who cares? He chose you. He chose you, and we should, we should rest assured in that. That's why it's called assurance, because we didn't earn it, and we do not deserve it. It is grace that God has given us in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. In vain... You rise early and you stay up late, toiling for food. He grants sleep to those he loves. In vain you rise early and you stay up late, toiling for food. Now Jesus, Jesus refers to Solomon in, in Matthew chapter six, when he's talking to his disciples about worry. So yes, worry about all these things. You worry about them, you know, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. And, you know, doesn't God take care of the birds? And and, and Solomon, in all his splendor, doesn't look as good as some of the fields that God, God clothes. In vain you rise early and you stay up late. And Solomon talks about this in Ecclesiastes. And he says everything is meaningless. Utterly meaningless. You toil for food. That brings us back to Genesis chapter 4, the curse. The product or the fruit of the curse is that it's going to be hard for us to live. That we are going to sweat when we cultivate the earth. There will be thorns and thistles. It is going to be a struggle. Life is not going to be easy. For he grants sleep. To those he loves. Now Solomon's talking about rest from God's judgment in the promised land. If they hold true to the, to the moral, civil, and purity laws of the Mosaic Covenant, they can have peace with God and live in the land that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promised land. But if they fail in this covenant relationship, they will be forced in exile. So he's talking about that we can rest from that sleep. But what's the, the, the messianic part of it? What's the shadow pointing us to the hope that we have in Christ? The Hebrew word for sleep is... Shana, and it means sleep. Okay, go figure, right? Um, but this was interesting. High rank. And I think about that. That he grants sleep or rest to those he loves. See, at salvation, we can rest in Christ's perfect works. In order to get to heaven, you've got to be born perfect, live perfect, die perfect. And the gospel counts Christ's perfect life, death, and resurrection as our own. I get to rest in that. That I don't have to try to obtain salvation with my own hands because I can and it's impossible. That is the beauty of the gospel. That is the good news. I can rest in that. He grants sleep to those he loves. And I also get to rest for the judgment of my works because the judgment for my works was poured into Christ on the cross. High rank though. What does that mean? What means this? As a child of God, you inherit the kingdom of heaven. You become a child of God. Who's your father? God. That's a pretty high rank to me. I thought that was pretty interesting when I dug a little more digging. Children are a heritage from the Lord and offspring, a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now the sad thing right here is Solomon wouldn't live up to his own words. See, Solomon would fall to idolatry. He'd have 700 wives and 300 concubines, and, and he'd pass this dysfunction on down to his kids. See, he didn't aim his kids towards the Lord. He failed. He tried, he had a season of doing it, but somewhere along the way, he fell to sinfulness. And he ended up aiming his kids towards the world, towards idolatry. And we would see this take hold in his son, Roboam. Roboam's pride would end up causing the kingdom of Israel to be split, to be divided. And now personally, when I read that, I, I have to ask myself, where am I aiming my kids? I think that most days I aim my kids towards the Lord, but not all days. Not all days do I aim my kids towards the Lord. Sometimes I might aim them towards idolatry, but this is, this is important for all of us as parents. We, we have to ask ourselves this daily. Where am I aiming my kids? With the way I talk and how I act. What are they picking up? Where will they go? With this, they will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. And Solomon's talking about as the, as your children grow up, they would defend their parents and their family at the city gates over civil and domestic disputes. That's what that line means. Now, but that's what kids are supposed to do, though. Kids are supposed to honor their mother and father, just like the commandment says. And now, remember the story that that I opened up with at Disney World, and Instagram, and the self and the self life. See, we should stand at the gates of the world. 
And we should represent God well. We should represent the life of Christ and what we say and what we do. All right, so now let's, let's make this all really simple. I kind of hit a whole bunch of things as we went through the passage. Now there's five verses, and I think that there's five points that we all can, can draw from this. Number one, so if you, if you had like a, a pencil or pen, I'd, I'd write this down. I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's pretty neat. These are the main points from each, each verse. Number one, divine grace. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Meaning that if you are if if you are lost, you need to wake up. You need to you need to wake up. Unless the Lord builds the house, your labor is is in total vanity. You need to repent from from your work, and you need to cling to Christ's work by faith. See, unless the Lord builds the house, unless you 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 grab a hold of the house that the Lord built, which is Christ's life, death, and resurrection by faith, what you do is vanity. Repent from your work, cling to Christ's work by faith. See, faith in Christ is the only means to be right with God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. This is divine grace that we touched on earlier. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's hand, we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. This is divine grace, that God has a plan and purpose for our lives. Number two, divine grace. Protection. We need this as Christians. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand in vain. Now, now I don't, I don't, I don't know about you, but but I was tired of protecting a doomed kingdom. Tired of it. When I was lost, when I was blind, when I was dead in my transgressions, when everything in my life was offending God, man. When God touched me, I looked around. I was like, I'm tired of defending dust. I'm tired of defending this. this. This whole life is doomed. See, unless the Lord builds it, it's doomed. It's doomed. We need to flee from that house that is on the sand. We need to get out of there as fast as we can. See, Jesus says, what good is it to a man who gains the whole world? Everything that the world has to offer. You get it all. You put it all in your midst. And you lose your soul. See, what's most important to a man? When he's sick, when he's dying... His soul. When he's healthy, when he's rich, the world. See, sometimes it takes it takes God taking us around the mountain for us to see the truth. Or what about the man that Jesus uses as an illustration who stored up the barns so they were super full, so that he could live fat and merry at the end of his life? And Jesus says, You fool, tonight your very life is demanded. From you, It's why we need to get out of the self-house as fast as you can because you never know when it's over. You never know when the end is up. See, children of God, we, we receive God's divine protection in Christ. We receive God's divine protection in Christ from, from the power of sin and from God's eternal judgment. Meaning that God saves us from Himself by Himself. Meaning that you... You don't, you, you don't work for salvation. So hear that clearly. You don't work for salvation. You don't deserve it. So I know some of you have to have a very high self-esteem. No. Lower it down. You do not deserve salvation. That's why it's called grace. And you didn't earn it. It is literally a gift of God. It is literally a gift of God. Salvation is all of God and none of you. That should bless you right now. If you're like, well, no, I did something... No, you don't want to do anything in the process because I promise you, you will mess it up. You will take your greedy, selfish, self-centered, self-righteous hands and you will mess it up. So you can only repent and have faith in Christ because God has given you a new heart and a new nature. He's opened your eyes to sin and to His judgment and He's turned you. He left the 99, went after you, threw you on his shoulders. You were kicking and screaming along the way. And you were mad until he brought you to the party. Like, oh, thank you for bringing me here. He turns you to his son. Now, listen, there is, there is a responsibility that we play in the process. But I just personally believe that I can only participate in this process because God has given me this responsibility to actually engage with him. Now, I don't understand how it all works, but I do know one thing. It is beautiful. It is beautiful to be made right with God. And not by your hands, but by Christ. 
That is why scripture says that we can't even boast about it. When I was a young Christian, you know I used to go around telling everybody the best decision I ever made was choosing Christ. Little did I know he chose me. And that's 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 okay. If that's where my my arrogance is in, I'm, I think I'm okay with that. Amen? Some of you are like, well, no, actually, I did a DMI on you the whole time you've been preaching. You got arrogance all over the place. Bro. Amen? <laughs> divine protection. Now, gentlemen, this is for you. Listen to this. Divine protection. If you didn't have divine protection over your life, you'd be dead. You wouldn't be in these seats. Think about everything you've tried to do to die. And God has sought fit to save you. Kenny, what God starts, He always finishes. He will bring you back around the mountain. Thank God that our life doesn't rest in our hands, but His. Number three, divine rest. Shana, for He grants sleep to those He loves. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28-30, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And we all know this, for, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We get the rest in Christ's works of obtaining salvation so that we don't have to try to obtain it on our own. And we get the rest in His death on the cross for our works. Rest, that is, that is a beautiful place to be at, to have peace with God. Number four, divine gifts. Children. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Now it took me a long time to see this. It took me a long time to see this. When my oldest daughter was born. And I'm ashamed to even share it with the church. But when my oldest daughter was born. I didn't see her as a blessing. I saw her as a curse. I didn't see her as a blessing. I saw her as a burden. Because I saw that, that a child was responsibility. And it would get in the way of fun. It would, it would slow me down from doing what I wanted to do in my selfishness. See, I didn't see a blessing. I saw, I saw a burden. Now, now, some of you guys are like, you know, that might sting a little bit because you're, you're right there. And that's, oh, that's, that's, that's okay. That's why you're here. So that God can open your eyes to the treasures that you have in your kids. So that you no longer see them as a burden, but that you start to see them as a blessing. Amen? See, thank God for His divine grace, protection, and divine rest. That, that changes our hearts from seeing our kids as burdens and then to blessings. See, what an honor it is to be a father. I know last week was Father's Day, but it is an honor. Where we honor fathers, but it, it, is, it, is, it is an honor to be a father. When, when God changes your perspective and you see that children are a heritage from the Lord. I was at Disney. As I shared earlier... We were walking out of the Magic Kingdom and both my, both my girls were in front of me. And I pulled out my phone and I was like, I've got, I got to capture this picture. And I, I took the picture and, I, and I'm looking at it. And I had this thought. And I, I almost missed it. Like, I almost missed this whole scene. I almost missed these two precious gifts in front of me. Because I thought that selfishness I thought that drugs were the gift and that everything else was the burden. My perspective was so wrong. Man, thank God. Thank God that God changed my heart and changed my perspective that I didn't have to miss this life. Amen? See, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a blessing and not a curse. See, gentlemen, if you're here right now, see, God can save you. If you're here right now, you can become a good father. If it wasn't too late for the thief on the cross, I, I promise you, it is not too late for you. Number five, last point, divine reflection. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents. See, we set our, our kids up to defend the truth and by the power of God, they reflect Christ as, we, as we, we all should do. See, children are a reflection of you. No matter how bad you want to say they're not, they are. Like, I remember when my, my seven-year-old was, was like three when we were in Target and she would just be act, acting off the chain. I'd try to distance myself from her and be like, that's not my child. That's not my child. Right? She's a reflection of her father, Adam. <laughs> not me. Right? She's sin-cursed. That's... that's 
She has nothing to do with me, right? But you ever heard the expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Well, that's a reality. <laughs> and as parents, our kids reflect us, whether it's good or whether it's bad, as we do with our Father. See, as Christians, we reflect God, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether you're a, a Christian in a high place in society, and then all of a sudden all this crazy sin comes out and it gets exposed, and then those who are atheists are like, see, Christianity, it's a joke. See, you're reflecting God, whether it's good or bad. See, what a blessing it is, though, as parents to pass down the gospel and God's truth to our kids. Because I remember what was passed down to me, and maybe what was passed down to you, and we get to change the course the direction of our family tree. See, unless the Lord builds the house, the labor is in vain. Are you building your house? If you are, flee from it as fast as you can because there is a storm coming and what you think is safe is very, very unsecure. It will come crumbling down before you know it. Or are you resting by faith in the house that God built to redeem sinners? Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And I pray for all of you today that you guys are resting in the house that God built. Amen.